Yeah, so I don't know if you overheard, but I have the plane slot, so we might pause as I have, have to process the loud noises. So, yeah. Um, but thanks for coming. Uh, it's really cool to like be at a conference in person again. It's kind of nice. Um, and thanks to all of the Pi Bay organizers uh, for a wonderful day. It's been really awesome. And uh, yeah, excited to be here and, and share some of, I guess, what I've learned building uh, platforms at companies that are not developer product companies. Uh, so it's like an interesting space. Um, so uh, I'm Nick. As you know now, I go by he, him. I'm at Nick DiRienzo on the internet. Uh, I don't post that often, but if you want to get in touch, happy, <laughs> happy to chat. Uh, my email is nick at rosnick.ai. Uh, and yeah, like uh, Mike said, I recently co-founded a very early stage company uh, called Rosnick. It's in the AI space for helping teams build better AI products through observability and other, th other things. But this talk is not about AI. That's the last time I will say AI. Uh, before that, I was a founding. <laughs> Everyone breathe. OK, that wasn't too bad. Before that, I was a founding platform engineer at Modern Health. It was a mental health benefits company. And uh, I had the good fortune of supporting uh, engineering growth from 20 to 60 people. Um, and it was really fun helping teams build amazing products to help people's mental health all over the world. Uh, and before that, I was at a company called Optimizely, building internal and external developer products. And before that, uh, I was on engineering producti productivity teams at Google. So while only one of them is called platform engineering, to me, they're all roughly in the same problem space. And so the question is, is like, what's a platform engineering team? And I think to answer that question, we have to talk about delivery teams. And delivery teams, in, in like my brain, are the ones that are like delivering value to the customers, right? Like they're building the features that like your users are using, and like, co like companies are paying your company money money for. Um, and you know, this might look, this will look probably similar. Uh, depending on where you are, but you know they have like engineers, right? They're building the software. You have engineering managers who are like doing stuff. Uh, product managers that are like actually prioritizing and figuring out customer pain, and designers who are, who are designing delightful solutions, and you know maybe other folks like user researchers, product analysts, stuff like that. And all these folks together build for this customer that's outside of the company. And then if we look at platform teams, you have engineers. They build software. You sometimes have engineering managers. Uh, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you have like a tech lead manager, or sometimes like all those engineers are reporting to the CTO, and she's super busy. So like, do you even have a manager? Uh, if you're lucky, you might have a product manager. Oftentimes, these teams don't. But again, this, this will look different depending on where you work. And uh, if you're super duper lucky, you'll have a designer. Uh, I wish uh, I've had those people, but I haven't. Um, and all these folks, I guess all the engineers, work together to solve problems for customers inside of the company. And so you might be wondering, like, why, why is that? Like, you know, why is there no PM? Why is there no design? And like, I think, to me, it's sort of like the business, here's this problem of like, I've heard engineers need to go faster. And so it's like this like technical problem. And so like you're an engineer, go solve that technical problem. Like you can do it, right? Just on your own. And like I found that kind of weird, because like when I look back on, on my life in software, it's like I think this is how you end up with like a bunch of scripts that like no one knows why they were created or how they work and like you might be running like a Django app, and then you have like some like Rails thing sitting in front of it for some reason that like calls Docker and then like does something else, and everyone's like, "What is going on?" Just me? Okay, sounds like just me. 
not just me. Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> and so, like, everyone's, like, in pain, right? They're frustrated, and they're like, this is why we're slow. Fix this problem. And, like, that's not how we build products. Like, it's just not. I think we deserve better. Like, these scripts need to, like, not just be scripts. Like, they need to, like, work in concert and solve real problems. And, like, I think we can do better. And to do better, we have to build products and not just infrastructure and scripts. And I find people buy software and buy software products to save time. And that, like, hey, engineers need to go fast is really, like, a problem where the business is saying, I need to save time. Like, that's kind of, like, the weird business reality uh, that we might not think of as engineers. And so, like, I think we get there by not thinking about our infrastructure and scripts as, like, that support our development as just infrastructure and scripts, but as products themselves. So how do we build products? Well, there's a whole team called delivery teams that build great products. They service people outside of the company. And, you know, maybe you're familiar with this. Maybe, maybe this is the first time you're learning about it. But what ends up happening is you have folks like product and design talking to customers to find their problems. Uh, you also have other folks, but like I'm simplifying this, right? Uh, and then once they have found problems, you have to prioritize those problems. And there's like the product person, engineers are like, I don't know, just tell me what the problem is. I'm going to put it in the sprint and like go, go, go. Design delightful solutions is what happens after you have prioritized problems. And then now you have like a whole funnel of things where you can actually finally go build software. And that's what the engineers do. And something that like you may or may not be aware of, but like those folks aren't actually selling the software because if we're not building stuff that people are using, like why are we doing it? So that's what the sales team is doing, which is important to highlight uh, in the context of this talk. And so you might be wondering, okay, I'm on a platform team. I don't know how many of you are, but you might be like, hey, I don't have a PM. <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> or like, I know the pain. I'm an engineer. Like, why do I need to talk to anybody? I don't want to talk to anybody. Or you might be like, I have my wish list of things because I've been here. I know where all the skeletons are in the closet. Just like put me in, coach. Let's get to work. Like, let's not waste time talking to people. But like, the reality is you're not building for yourself. On platform teams, there's still a customer, and it's not you. The customer is the delivery teams. Your job is to make them go fast and far. And it's usually the engineers that are the actual users of the software that you're building. They have frustrations, fears, and dreams, and they're not necessarily yours. And so you have to learn what their pain is and then solve for that pain. And you might be thinking, that's really hard. I'm not a PM. I'm not a user researcher. How am I supposed to ask these questions? I don't want to talk to people. I just want to write code. Well, I have a solution for you. You might like it. You might not like it. But I believe we need to take inspiration from delivery teams to build better internal tools to support developers. So what does that look like? Well, let's look at the activities. We have to find customer problems. I don't have a PM. That's on engineering. I have to prioritize those problems. Oops, guess that's me too. I also have to design delightful solutions to the problems that we found and prioritized. Guess that's also on engineering. I also have to build the stuff. OK. And you know, if, like I said earlier, if you're not getting usage of the things that you've built, why do we spend time building it? So you're also now a salesperson. And on top of that, you're also on call for everything. <laughs> and like, you get woken up all the time. And so like, you're probably thinking, no. <laughs> I'm going to leave this talk right now because I think you're going in the direction that I think, and I'm terrified. But it's worth it. I really think it's worth it. And like this, like following these, these activities and trying, the act of trying allows us to build better developer products. 
And I want to share with you some practices that I've done over, over time to make this like, manageable, despite not having all of that support. So let's start with finding problems. And unfortunately, there's no magic solve here. You have to talk to people. Like, it sounds crazy, <laughs> but it works. And one of the ways that you can talk to people is one-on-one. -on -one. And so like, I found that talking to engineers who really care about what the platform team is doing, whether that's positively or negatively, uh, is really, really healthy. The people who are asking critical questions of what we're building and why are really helpful to understand their problems. And the people who are early adopters of the stuff that you're building, also great people to get feedback from. And you also don't want to be in these conversations and just listening for the positive comments. You also want to hear the things that they're maybe not saying that is still pain, or the things that they're directly frustrated about. It's not easy to hear, but it's important to hear it. Another tactic I've used is to like hold space in like these communities of practice meetings, like a Python guild, uh, where like all the people who are building in Python come together like once a week or you know twice a month or something. And once a quarter, I would put 15 minutes on the agenda, and I would start the topic with a very simple question. What is most painful for you all right now? And then I would just listen. Silence is really awkward. And so people fill the void. And people also like to complain. So you find really interesting problems when you do something like this. And another tactic I've used is like if the stars align and like a product is, like is being built and you're able to embed on that team as a platform engineer, you can actually learn firsthand by working with that team and collaborating with them directly and find real pain. It's super helpful if you're like, building ne like the next new technology for the business and you like need early adopters. I've talked to, like to a lot uh, I've talked a lot about engineers here, but I think it's also important to talk to folks outside of engineering too because they also have a perspective on product development. PMs, designers, sales folks, customer success. They're like I don't I've never talked to a salesperson. I think you should. Um, they also have a perspective on the product development that's happening at the company and they might have problems that you may or may not be able to solve. But it's worth hearing them. OK, now that you have problems that you found, you need to prioritize them. And unfortunately, we can't just be like, hey, PM, OK, we'll prioritize this, because that's our job on the platform team. And the bad news is it's an art, not a science. I know like, programming is like this nice scientific thing where we can like, experiment and understand and get like, real quantitative feedback. But it's not, it's not like that. <laughs> it's messy, and like there's, it's very context. Everyone, everyone, take a breath. Cool. All right. There's no real framework. Like, you might hear like, "Hey, just put it all in a spreadsheet. Give it a score. Sort the spreadsheet. You have your roadmap." That's not actually how it works. It's like super messy. It's context dependent on where your business is and like the size of your team and like what people really want. It's like a whole thing. So, despite saying that frameworks are like bad, I have two that you might want to try. Uh, and one is like important versus urgent, and looks like this. And it's a very simple framework to help visualize the work. You figure out what is important and you figure out what is urgent. And then you do that stuff. Uh, everything else, you can kind of plan around or like push off to another team or just say, we're never doing it. Like I have other things to do. It helps you say no. Um, another one is this effort versus impact thing. Uh, and you want to like do the low, low effort, high impact stuff. Uh, but you know that only gets you so far because that's just a bunch of easy wins. You eventually do have to take on big bets. The third thing is once you have some semblance of prioritization, talk to people. Again, get feedback on that, on that roadmap that you've prioritized and see if it makes sense. See if people have feelings around it. Because um, you know, it's, it's a process. OK, we've found problems. We've prioritized problems. The last thing is design. 
and it's by certainly no means least, and this is a talk on its own, and there's companies that are building amazing developer products out there, and try not to do that if your company is not a developer product, like you'll put too much pressure on yourself. Um, but I think there's things that you can think about as you build developer products at your own companies to build delightful solutions. One is to think about workflows. How do you take things that are like multiple steps, multiple scripts, things that like take a lot of time and manual effort and make it a single click? Like products are purpose built to solve a customer problem in a self-service way with limited handholding. They optimize workflows and feel like a joy to use. We should try to do that for the stuff that we're building for our developers too. And like they're it's hard. Like it's sometimes a CLI or maybe like a service or something. And it's like there's no like UI that someone's using, but there is. Like the CLI is a UI. And so like if you stay user centered, like I think you'll find great solutions by meeting your users where they are. For example, if like you're like, hey, I'm super jazzed about moving to Kubernetes because like, that's what we need to do as a platform team. I'd, I'd urge you to stop and ask yourself why. And not only why, is your team ready to use Kubernetes? Because like, holy cow, is that a mess? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, no, really, like, they want to focus on delivering value. And like, if you add barriers to delivering value, they're not going to adopt what you're building. So meet them where they are and lower the barrier to entry. Lastly, is to build on the shoulders of giants. There's a ton of amazing Python projects out there to help you build good developer tools. Use them. And if they're not open source, that's also fine. Solving a solution by buying software and paying a software as a service vendor or something else is still a solution to a problem and can still make people happy. So, you know, that's the last thing. OK, a lot of theory, a lot of theory. But how does this apply in the real world? Let me take you on a little bit of a journey of this like hypothetical world that you found yourself in as maybe an engineer at a startup who's like focused on platform and you know things seem to be going well. There's like a Django app, there's like this Flask auth app that's abstracted away, there's Docker, it's all running in AWS. This is not based on my life at all. Um, and like things things are good. But like just because things are good doesn't mean that you should not look for problems. Like PMs and folks are looking for problems all the time to try to make everything better. So that's, that's your job. So you go and you talk to folks. And you're like, hey, engineers, I'm looking for problems. And they're just like, oh my god, everything's terrible. Just keep hearing stuff. And then like, you talk to other folks. And like, you, know, you find out from product folks that they want to build zero to one products real soon. And your VP is like, hey, we need to like, double or triple the engineering team in like six months, and you're just like, what is happening? What am I supposed to do here? Uh, there's like things as little, uh, quote unquote, as little as, we're not on Python 3.12. Why are we not on Python 3.12? To things as big as, we have to launch a new product. How do you make sense of this? You prioritize. And so you take all that stuff, and you like throw it into the grid. And you know, maybe you, you decide that it's important to be on Python 3.12, but it's not urgent. Or you decide that it's like not important and not urgent to move to Kubernetes. Um, so you end up focusing on that top right corner. And you're like, OK, I think there's this problem of we need to build new products. It's hard to do that today. How can we make this better? So you pick a problem. Focus on that top right. And so you have this hypothesis, and you're like, hey, if we tackle this problem of enabling engineers to move to build net new products in an isolated way, could we move faster with higher quality? And so you take this idea and you shop it around. And people are like giving you positive feedback. So you keep going down this, this path. And so now you start, they're like, okay, cool, what does it look like? Give me some something tangible that like I can understand. So you're like, OK, I have this like, great idea. We'll use cookie cutter, and we'll like, put all of our existing infrastructure patterns into a single place. We'll generate new services. We'll keep it super simple. We'll meet you where you are. We're not changing anything that you know. We're just making it easy to get started. And you know, part of the platform team is to codify those shared definitions and help people get up and running faster 
And that's, that's helpful because as a team is growing too, you realize, okay, if we have these shared definitions, people can like move across teams uh, and get up to speed really fast. So now we're saving time. We're always saving time. And then the last thing is, okay, cool, I wanna design a solution that makes it safe by default. Like you saw these, you heard these challenges around runtime issues and other security problems. And so you're like, how do we put this on Rails so the safe thing is the easy thing? And so you take all this, you package it up, you turn it into like a tech spec or something, and you shop it around, and people are like, cool, but I have questions. Something that you didn't do before is talk to front end engineers when you were coming up with that hypothesis. And so now you get feedback, like, how does this impact me as a front end engineer? And you're like, oh, I didn't think about that. Or, you know, the back end engineers are like, that's neat, but like, how do I use it? Because it's still not clear. And then they're like, why would I even use this? Like, they're still not sold, but like, they, they're interested. Um, someone asks, like, what is cloud infrastructure? And you're like, oh, uh, maybe I didn't meet them where they are. Um, and it goes on. And so you find more feedback. And you're like, okay, I guess I got to keep iterating and I'm not ready. But that's okay because, like, what just happened is the product development process. But we're doing that for our products to support our developers, which we weren't potentially doing before. And, you know, that was just like one problem. You might have prioritized that entirely differently, gone down a different rabbit hole. And that's great, that's totally fine. But it allows you to be thoughtful in why you're tackling certain problems. Um, and, you know, the thing that I find fun about building products internally is that, you know, your customers are your teammates. They're right next to you or they're in Slack. You can just ping them and bring them along on the journey, ask them questions, listen to them, get feedback and move fast. I think it's actually a gift to be able to work so close to your customers, but other people might, you know, see differently. <laughs> so, you know, kind of like to wrap, as like a platform engineer, like I think we can build better solutions for our engineer teammates by shifting our mindset a bit and focusing on their pain first. As long as you wear your product hat, talk to your talk to your users, hear their problems, prioritize what you're what you're hearing and be thoughtful in design, you'll find a great solution. That's what I think. So, you know, if you're on teams like this or you're building solutions for your own, try not to think about things as just infrastructure and scripts, but as products themselves. So speaking of customers, shameless plug, if you're building with AI, I'd love to hear you about the problems that you have because I don't want to just solve problems that I have. But that's the talk. Thank you, and you know, happy to answer any questions. I'll be around all day, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in the weird shirt, six so just minutes. find me. <laughs> so we have six minutes. Anyone uh, for a QA? and a Anyone want to answer? Um, could you explain a bit more how to, uh, I have a hard time just decoupling in my head urgent versus important? Like, what's an example of something that would be urgent but unimportant? I guess the top left corner. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so something that, uh, it could be something that is like, hey, this needs to happen tomorrow, but is it the like, most important thing for you to do? Like, it's a, it's a, it's a t I know it kind of just repeated what you said, but it's like, it's a tension around different perspectives on prioritization. And like, urgent is around timing, importance is on value, if that, if that helps. Okay, okay, that makes sense. I'm happy to dig into like a specific example too, if you want, but it's a good question. Okay. So you spoke about having conversations with users are there formal conversations that you find valuable? For example, there's uh, the scrum planning process and there's also the PR uh, pull request process. Uh, how do you sort of slot into those? Yeah, so I, I think it's a mix. So when I say talk, talk to folks, uh, 
it can be anything from like a casual coffee chat to something that's like more structured, like a user interview, where you come up with like specific questions around a hypothesis of a problem that you have, and you want to go and like figure that out. Um, and you mentioned pull requests, right? And like what I was saying earlier of like you're working with your customers, so you could like show them a PR and be like, hey, what do you think of this? Um, which like I think is is pretty interesting. But I, I mean, I don't know. I don't have like a framework necessarily. It kind of depends on what you want to do. It's really just to me it, the core of it is ask questions, listen, and try to interpret their like try to interpret what they're saying as like what are the real problems that they're they're finding. You okay? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I hate when that happens. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's sort of like my perspective on it. I'm not totally sure if this is a good question, but do you know why there are never product managers attached to platform teams? Is there an obvious reason it wouldn't work? It, it, it really depends. Um, so like a lot, of, a lot of my experience is that those teams lack PMs, but some of them do. Uh, like especially if they're like well-resourced or if they're like super critical to like a particular technical area of the business, um, and it's not just like a general tools team, then then they might have PMs. My my hypothesis is that it's a question of like time and value and, and money, where it's just like, you know, and they also think of functions d depending on the size of the company. It's like like if you're at Facebook, they have PMs for these teams, but like when you're at a really scrappy startup, which is a lot of my experience, it's like. Well, if we need a PM, we want them to work on customer-facing, revenue-generating work, and I can't figure out how to map that to like what you're doing. Is is my view on it? Hi, uh, this is Bhupesh. So one problem which uh, I faced in my last company was uh, I worked in a team called Special Projects Group. Oh, it's kind of like the customer figure, figures out a bug, a CFD, and then you need to fix them very uh, abruptly. So when we used to do this process, we s create some other bugs, like fixing the existing bug, and then we create some other bugs. And we used to follow a lot of uh, uh, like infrastructure as code, like Terraform to like deploy our uh, like the pieces, microservices, and then we used to test them. So still, we used to create a lot of these bugs. So how do you think efficiently, more efficiently, can it be handled? Because uh, we also used IAAC. And still, the the problem did not exist. Uh, like, did not get solved fully. Is is the core of your question like how do I, how do I handle? How do I improve the process mm -hmm. uh, so that because the thing which happens was the contract used to break, mm -hmm. and that's what creates us another problem. Oh, like how do I have high quality during that my process? Yeah. Uh, it's. I, I hate to give this answer. It's like very context dependent, but like one, I think accepting that bugs are a reality is okay, and then like retrospecting on that. Okay, if your manager doesn't accept that, uh, then yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I I think like part of being on teams like this is that the bar for quality is high. Like, yes, that is a thing that happens, but, but you're also working on things that are generally like impacting almost everybody. So, so yeah, of course, like you don't want to ship, ship bugs. Um, but like you're, you shouldn't let like perfection get in the way of progress is sort of where my head goes. And like, it, just cause there's like an issue if, if it's like a one-off issue, that's like, it's fine. People ship bugs all the time to, to software. Um, I think where it becomes a problem is if there's patterns in those bugs and you're not doing incident retrospectives or things like that to improve the process around it. I don't know if this is like a good answer, but like, yeah, I, <laughs> it's, it's complicated. It depends on the context. I, I think it's time for your talk, yeah? Thanks, thanks. thanks folks. Thanks.